What's up, party people? It's Talib Kweli. We are back with the People's Party. Thank you for rocking with us. Thank you for showing us your love and your support. Of course, and as always, I have my lovely and talented and thoughtful co-host Jasmine Lee. Give it up for Jasmine Lee in the place to be. What's up, Jasmine? I can't clap for myself it, today. <laughs> you got something new going on with your hair. I like yes, it. Yes, I did. I, That's probably why my hands are freaking broken. I did some braids. You did quarantine. that yourself? Yeah, man, it's quarantine. I'm not about okay. to have nobody in here. Okay, word up. Good job, good job. Thank you. All right, so today, I want to get right into it because um, I don't want to spend too much time on the intro because this man really needs no introduction. But it was very challenging for me to come up with the questions for this next guest because there's just too many questions. Um, but this, this dude is one of the most prolific writers of the Black American story, period. He's a poet, an author, a hip hop star, an actor. There's a lot of famous people who who try to do it all, but whatever this man puts his mind to, he does so damn well. From when he first started, his first album, Can I Borrow a Dollar, to Resurrection, to One Day It All Makes Sense, to the golden era of working with the Soul Quarians like, like Water for Chocolate, Electric Circus. Then he got on a good music wave with B, Finding Forever, The Dreamer, The Believer. Putting out Nobody Smiling, Black American Again, Black America Again, Let Love. There's so many classics and he stays relevant. He won an Oscar and a, go and a Golden Globe for his song Glory. And I haven't even mentioned the acting work. He was an American gangster with Denzel Washington. Street Kings, Just Right, Selma, Suicide Squad. He was gangster in Suicide Squad. He'd been in a Terminator movie. A uh, man, this motherfucker was in a Terminator movie, bro. And recently he's taken over the role. Uh, <laughs> recently he's taken over the role of Wesley in the home movie of Princess Bride. This man is prolific. This man got bars. This man is one of my best friends in the music business. And I'm very, very honored to have this man as a friend and be able to call him my friend. Give it up for Common from the city of Chicago. Yeah! And he's a rapper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah fam, you. Yo, Kwa, thank you. Thank you, Jazz. Kwa, you know I love you, brother. That was, man, that just moved my spirit, man, hearing you say that, you know, because <laughs> I got so much respect and love for you. You inspire me, man. So anyway, uh, thank you, man. Jazz, you know I found you do. You know what we do. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's I'm go. Ready. Let's go. I just no started being able to get to the, being able to do that. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that good at that. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Let's that go. like fam you gang signs? It's the Rattlers. He's striking yeah. and striking and striking again. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, Rashid, uh, Common, <laughs> Rashid, Lonnie, Lonnie, Rashid, Lane. You have a bunch of other names that I don't really know know about. I know Lonnie and Rashid. Um, I want to thank yeah. you for jumping on Respiration on the Black Star album. This is the track. It was a single from Black Star. It really got things moving. And, um, you know, I've told you a little bit about the story about how I got you on Respiration, but I, for the for the People's Party audience, um, Common was my favorite rapper at the time, and I essentially chased him around the country <laughs> trying to get him on Respiration. <laughs> I saw him. He was about to perform at, at Wetlands in New York City, and his manager, Derek Dudley, did not let me on a tour bus. And that's how I met my manager at the time, Corey Smith, <laughs> Because Corey Smith let me on a tour bus. But that first time I got to you, I I had the track with me. But you didn't agree to get on the track because I didn't know you. And so I went to, uh, you had a show at the Belly Up in San Diego later on that year. And I went to the show and I snuck backstage. I oh snuck God. past Derek Dudley because he was trying to stop me from getting backstage again. <laughs> um, and um, I got Dudley. with you and you like... <laughs> yeah, shout out to Derek Dudley. He was on his job, right? He was on his job. That's a good manager. Um, I, I got with you, and um, this time it was like a more a recognition. You was like, oh, you you Most Def's man, right? Okay, you wanted me to do that song. And then Most Def had a show in Chicago where he was opening for you. And so I took an Amtrak train to Chicago so I could jump on stage with Most Def because I knew you would be there. And we were all in a dressing room after the show, and I said... Do you want to go in the studio and record the song tonight? And you said yes, but I had booked Streeterville Studios in Chicago just in case you wanted to do that. Wow. So we went to Streeterville, me, Hot Tech, Most Def, and you. And the beat that I had picked for the song, you and Most Def, was like 
we don't want to rap on that beat. I was like, nah, fuck this. I worked too hard to get this song. Y'all go rap on this beat. <laughs> and that y'all yeah. didn't rap on that beat. Y'all chose another beat, which became Respiration. But that's how that song got done. So I thank you for jumping on that song, bro. Wow. Nah, man. Thank you, yo. Man, the more I hear the story over and over again, it's like, damn, that just is the... To me, it just shows the determination of, of like you putting your mind towards something and just being unstoppable and, and and like persistent and committed to it. And look what it created. Like, I mean, that was a blessing for me to be on that song. Like that song to this day is one of the greatest songs, collaborations I ever been on. And being associated with you and most deaf, like being on a Black Star song was like a it's a medal for me, you know, like meaning mm. it was um you know, it was a notch in 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 my career, and it has been and continues to be. And I, it's one of those songs that, like, man, people every every place I go, some some at some point in time, they like, why don't you do? You gonna do respiration? I'm like, I'm, I'm just <laughs> grateful that y'all. I'm grateful you was in pursuit that much, quite like. And I, <laughs> so so I love I love that man. And I remember we had my man Deshaun play guitar. We had a little guitar That's to right. it. It was. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. That song just yeah. got a vibe to it. So thank you, man. Yes, man. Thank you. Sounds now, like when a we TV did the video, episode. that whole that whole story, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> when we did the video for Respiration, it was the coldest day of the year that year. And um, you wore this big, lush, green fur coat with green fur coat with fur hat combination. And people didn't know it was green because the video was in black and white. But tell me why you picked that outfit for that day and how your personal style um, has has evolved in your career. Well, I picked that, like, I was really, I, when I when we did Respiration, that's when I first moved from New, from Chicago to New York. I moved to Brooklyn. You know, I and you was living Brooklyn. in Brooklyn, Quiet. hanging out with us at the, book, at the bookstore yep. and the Brooklyn Moon Cafe and all that. At the bookstore, yes, all that. So... I kind of met, I'm, I met up with different artists at, at that point. Like I'm talking about people who, you know, fashion designers who was like just black people who were doing dope stuff, dope artists like Ashaka Givens. Who Shout was, out to was, Ashaka was, Givens and, and Lorraine yeah. West. And Lorraine West. There was like, they was part of the whole like family art, artist collective. And basically mm -hmm. they were making stuff. Um, and, and, and I was like, man, I'm doing this video. And she was like, I got the right thing. Like, so she she made me this coat. And, and you know, I'm not like a pimpish dude. I'm not like, I don't dress pimp style, but for some reason it felt like forward, but it still had a little bit of throw of some Chicago soul to it. So I, I rocked that coat. I was geeked about it, man. And uh, you know, that was when I was in the evolution of <laughs> I was in the evolution of um, you know, like evolving my style. Cause I, I ain't gonna front. Like I I change a lot. Like, I, you know, I just, you know, I go with where I am in the moment and what I feel and what I'm inspired by. And at that point, for me, being in New York was like a next step to another type of freedom and artistic expression. Because, you know, mm -hmm. New York has so many different artists and people and cultures, and you really are allowed to be yourself there, you know. So I think that was that was part of me just breaking out and being like, yo, I'm on some new stuff. <laughs> I love it. Um, so let's talk about teachers for a second. Your mother, Mahalia Ann Hines, is a teacher. Yeah. Uh, she's worked with uh, my mother, Brenda Green, and rest in peace to Don DeWest, Kanye West's mother. Um, why Clef yes, talked to us about... Peace. Yeah, yeah, definitely, to Don DeWest. Why Clef talked about how the connection that preachers' children have with each other, but let's talk about the connection that the children of teachers have. Um, how do you think yeah. that shared background of having teachers as as parents connected you, me, and Kanye and other artists to each other? Well, as you remember, Kwa, when we did um, we did a panel with our mothers at Chicago State, it was mm -hmm. Dr. Donda West, your mom, um, mm -hmm. and my mother, and me, you, and Kanye. Um, and mm -hmm. one thing I noticed at that at that panel was like wow, we really were blessed to have teachers as mothers because they really gave us the the desire for education and, and mm -hmm. books and, and like, intelligence was valued. Like, I, I, I honestly, my mother wouldn't, I wouldn't have privileges if I didn't do good in school, if I didn't read mm -hmm. these things. And she would make me do extra book reports and, and little did I know that that was, <laughs> yeah, your mom was like that? Yes. Jen? So it was, but I but I developed a love for reading and a love for words that 
she didn't know that I, and I didn't know that it would turn out to be something that I would utilize as, as part of my expression and, and it's my profession now. And when I look at you, yeah. when I look at Ye, um, it's something about the academics that, that, ma- that shapes for a better MC to me, like a better mm. artist all around because, you know, I mean, let's face it, intelligence is, is valued. It's, it's like golden and, and like yeah. learning things is important and the fact that, you know, you know how um, much depth you have, Kwa, with and just how, you know, in the books you are. And I think mm-hmm. when I listen to you rhyme, it, it, it pays off. I feel like I'm learning, being entertained, being inspired. Like, you know, that was the thing I loved about hip hop from the beginning for me was it was I was always always felt like I was getting new information um, in certain mm-hmm. ways. And it wasn't like it was like being um it wasn't being forced upon. It's the it's art form. It's music. But yeah. when I look back and, and hear things that KRS-One said, um, it, it opened my thinking up. Um, Rakim and the Brand Nubians and, you know, all those cats. Like Ice Cube, too. All of them. So, um, yeah, man, I think being, being sons of teachers is one of the greatest blessings we've had. I mean, what do you think, Kwa? Do you feel like... Do, do you ever notice a difference between the... The MCs that feel like they come from academic backgrounds. Um, yeah, I think it's it's very integral to my process. Um, I think I've rapped more about books than any rapper, and I think it's it's because of my parents, but also working <laughs> at the bookstore. Um, I think yeah. that you know when people talk about, we had Reggie Hudlin on, and he talks about how hip hop mm-hmm. is always talked about being irresponsible lyrically, uh, misogynistic, uh, decadent, capitalistic, but people don't give hip hop enough credit for uh, being the vanguard when it comes to um, being responsible in lyrics. Like for every negative mm-hmm. lyric you can find from hip hop, I could find three positive ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, yeah. I talk about often just the privilege. You said, you, you said that you wouldn't get privileges if you didn't do certain things. We are very privileged to have educators as parents. We have academic privilege. That whole yeah. kerfuffle yeah. between No Name and J. Cole was based around an argument about academic elitism. The the critique J. Cole, I think, was making. Yeah. And we you and me spoke privately about this, and we appreciate pardon me. We appreciate both No Name and J. Cole. But the the argument yeah. he was attempting to make, whether or not he made it to to the satisfaction of everybody listening, the the argument he attempted to make right. was you can't be an elitist as an academic. And that I felt that in my soul um, because I understand that I had the privilege mm-hmm. of having a mother that cared enough to make sure I had books and take me to a museum. An artist like 50 Cent, he's a fantastic artist. I think 50 Cent is a genius, but his parents were drug dealers. And so that reflects in his music. His music is violent, it's angry. His music is not necessarily positive, as good as, as it is. His music reflects the pain and the struggle. Our music also reflects the pain and the struggle, but it, it comes from a more academic lens, and um and I'm 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 highly appreciative of it. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, what was was dope about what you just described too. It, it just really shows the 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 how diverse and and the depth that we have too, as because you could take a kid like like Nas, I was talking to Nas, and Nas was like, Nas dropped out of school at one point, like I, I don't right. think out of high school at some point. Regardless, he said it was his mother had these books at the house, like the Book of the Tibetan Dead and, and different stuff. Mm. That he, he said he was reading before he was a teenager. And I, mm. I always wonder, like, when I listened to him, um, I was like, man, this dude's thinking is on a different level. And I always feel like, you know, like it shows that, like, what you said is you might you could come from the hood and and depending on what what you've been what information has been shared and what you've come across then you will mm-hmm. be coming from an elevated perspective too and I think it just shows the depth of of who we are as as um as black men and women and also another thing that you was talking about that I that um I think it's dope that like for me like I when I read I feel like I get better, better as an MC, yeah. and I actually, you know, it's times where I was stuck, and you know, I I can remember in the mid '90s where I was just searching, you mm. know, for what I wanted to say, and like had to think of things that I wanted to talk about, and man, reading these Buddhist books and reading the Quran and reading and reading um 
you know, message to the black man, you know, yeah. of Elijah Muhammad's and and then the destruction of black civilization. All these things was right, like, Chancellor Williams. okay, All right. yes, I was, I was, um, it really allowed me to know what I could do with words too. I would go to this book called Black Black Poets. You ever seen that book, Black Poets, with by Dudley Randall? It's got Absolutely. all these, all these different poets. Literally, I was just, Jad, I would just open up the the book. As soon as I would see something, I would just go, oh, I could go right. Because right. it just made me know um, the power of words and and like what we can do with words. And I think, well, you've been showing that as an MC. And I think like people like Nas that even, you know, came from the Jex and still mm-hmm. came and elevated things has done that. You're giving out the secrets now, brother. You telling that's a <laughs> word right there. I always I have a lyric about this. Um, I don't remember my actual lyric, but the premise of the lyric was if I walk in your house and you ain't got no books on the shelf, I can't trust you. <laughs> I like that. And I think, you know, um, what the one of your earlier points, too, is that I think is important that I was trying to think of what I was like I, when you were saying it was that, yo, when you get certain information, like we were privileged to have mm. parents who were able to do that, share that information and inspire yeah. us to learn. Um, one thing that, that helped me out was my mother would bring home kids who were like, she taught, and they would, she would let them stay for the weekend or whatever, and they were from the hood. They were from mm. even more hood than where we was from. Like, mm. you know, and it was like, I seen that these kids didn't have the parents I had, so mm. it made me value what my mother was and, right. and who my mother was and my stepfather. And then, and then I was like, oh man, I gotta be able to share this information with others or try to get them access to this too. So that's been always like, man, like when I write, I think about like some of the people that I can inspire that don't that don't have access. Yeah. I almost feel like now my I want my career and, and and all the work I do to create more access for people who don't have. That's really what it is. And that's beautiful. I was just speaking yeah. on that because I was like, that's the importance of why I feel people like you that have parents or and like me like Talib that have parents that teach them at home should be going to public schools because you never know who else you're going to touch and who you're going to teach somebody teach something to cuz like you guys my mom was an English major so she made us write yeah. essays and we got into a fight we had to write an essay about why we shouldn't fight our sisters so like when we wow. were in school like our writing skills were amazing and it's a lot of kids that you know were encouraged by that Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, we shot. We talked about your mother being a teacher. I want to send a big rest in peace to Lonnie Pops Lynn, your father. Um, yes, your yes. father was so gracious. He was living in Denver, and he would come to all my shows in Denver just because I was your homie. Oh. And he would be Man. backstage and making sure we was good. He was like, "If you ever need anything in Denver, people know your father because you put him on your albums. He had these soulful spoken word pieces on your album, Pops Rap." from Re- uh, Resurrection stood out um, to me. Your father said on the album, he wanted to set up a boxing match against him and Jesse Jackson. And he want to kick <laughs> Jesse Jackson's ass. Now for people who are not black people from Chicago, can you break down why your pops would want to kick Jesse Jackson's ass? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first of all, let me say this. When I got that message, dude, I, like, cause that was the days when you, people was leaving messages on your phone. So, right. I got that message, man. I was laughing so hard. I was like, man, my dad is crazy, man. But my he dad said that was, he said he said pops crazy. I know I know pops crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He said so. My dad was, as you know, pops was like he had something crazy about him, but it was something very wise about him. Like he mm. was so wise. Like he he was a Gemini. He just had these all these different sides to him oh. to a certain degree, and uh, and um, but. He he really always was pro black. Um, you know, he named me Rashid because he he said he wanted to mix a mu- a Muslim name with a Christian name because my first name is Lonnie like his, which mm-hmm. he considered a Christian name, and he because he was studying Islam too, he wanted to name me Rashid. So he always mm-hmm. had all he had things behind what he was saying, but then some stuff he'd be like, he'd be like, "Pops, where you coming from with that shit?" That's <laughs> so I asked him like, "What is what what he meant?" He just was like, man, he was sick of Jesse Jackson at that time, like just parading around like he was he just thought that thought Jesse Jackson was one of them dudes that was just like doing it in the for the show of it and was like mm. 
he knew he was doing real work, but he mm-hmm. also was like, he wanted to be seen doing it. And I don't know, mm-hmm. maybe he just had one of those, spa- I don't know if he had been drinking that day or whatever, but he just, <laughs> he snapped out. By the way, Qua, you said something earlier. I got to clarify too that, okay. man, the freaking, on, my, on Wikipedia, it got all these names that ain't my fucking name. Oh, that's that's what I'm talking like about. It had all these names. I said, I didn't know Ross yo, had so I many names. <laughs> yo, yo, Qua, yo, Jazz, Qua, I don't have... Is, you said it exactly. <laughs> Lonnie Rashid Lynn is my name. Somebody can go on my Wikipedia and just keep fucking change. I, I try to change it back every time. And it's like, That's they keep putting all these no, names. They, it's, and the pe- funny about you saying that is that it, Wikipedia has all these names and then it starts talking about you and it says, Karant was born in... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who, who the hell is that? Because sometimes people will say, yo, all these, they'll be coming. I'll be like, yo, that is not my. That's hilarious. But that's, you know, anyway, yeah. But Pops was, God bless his soul, man. My, yes. My Pops, man, that like, man, it's, he's a, man, I miss him. As soon as you start talking about it, he loved, he loved you. He loved most. He loved, mm. like, the roots. He loved my fam, man. And, mm. and but he really appreciated you as an artist too. Like he got, mm-hmm. he had his own appreciation too. It was like right. these your brothers and sisters. We I love them, but then it was also like man, these they cold. Like these dudes <laughs> get mine. Like, like and right. he knew what it was. So mm. so it was dope, man. I he at one point he wanted to do his own EP, and I was really trying to set it up for him. But he eventually, you know, um, with cancer, he he was fighting and battling. He mm. actually went down to see Doctor Sabi, um, and was like mm. having a good time with Doctor Sabi. They was. He was wow. healing, smoking weed, smoking weed with Savy, kicking okay. it like, wow. okay, yeah. But uh, but it was um, you know, it ended up the, the the disease ended up, you know, basically he transitioned and and um, man, it's crazy because where we are, Kwa, as you know, um, in where we are right now is where my mother and father met actually in Xenia, Ohio. So Central crazy. State, yeah, Central State, Central yeah. State, and Wilberforce. My, my my mother went to Central State, my father went to Wilberforce. So it's, right. it's uh, being around here kind of it was it was it was moving. I text my mother like, "Yo, mom, I'm out here like where y'all met, you know." Yeah, so, man. Uh Dave Chappelle, thing. we out here hanging out with Dave and he said, "Come and I'm going to take you to where your parents met." And we wow. drove through these cornfields and pulled up at 4 in the morning. I was cold as shit in the back <laughs> it was of the truck. <laughs> Probably was like, man, it's cold out here, man. It's all good and shit, but it's cold out here. I had to go it to was cold. I, I, well, how, I wasn't going to miss that opportunity to be in the back of a pickup truck with you and Dave Chappelle. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I was cold. I was tired. I was drunk. I was, you know what I'm saying? But I was like, nah, I'm not missing yeah. this opportunity. Um, yeah. It, it is something, though, quiet that we have these moments, like, as close of friends as we are, and we, we brothers. We, mm-hmm. we love each other. Yeah. But it's still, I do value, like, Yo, it's me, Kwa, it, Dave, right. Tiffany, um, right. M- Michelle, Muhammad. All like That's these right. are moments, man. I'm starting to appreciate moments more in life, like and just really be present and be like, man, I'm mm. gonna take this in, yeah. like I'm gonna enjoy yeah. this moment. I ain't, you know, and I appreciated that. Come on, man. Who would have <laughs> thought we'd be riding in the back of a pickup truck going to look at Dave's farms at four in the morning That's in right. Yellow Springs, Ohio? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Uh, speaking of enjoying moments of the, some of the, my most favorite moments were at FAMU. We went to the same school. I'm wearing my orange for us today. Um, (laughs) and you have, I I don't like y'all talking to cold like this, man. I just said I'm wearing orange. Y'all got, y'all got got gang colors, gang signs. And I got my green toes (laughs) too. I'm not, I can't put my foot up right now, but if I could, I would have showed you my toenails. But, uh, I love this one. Rattle it out. Uh, you also have an honorary doctorate in the arts from FAMU. Um, what do you think it is about HBCUs that makes it such a vital part of black excellence and is so instrumental in the story of black excellence in America? Well, that was, for me, it was one of the greatest gifts in my life to go to Florida and yes. university, to go to a black college. Um, obviously for me growing up, um, my mother went to a black college. Uh, you know, the Cosby Show had, you know, they had different world. Hip hop cast was when black college. I went on a black college tour. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. But what was so significant for me was actually, you know, growing up in Chicago, I had one type of, I knew one type of blackness pretty much, you know, mm-hmm. like what we had in Chicago. But to go to 
Florida and them and be in Tallahassee, Florida and experiencing people from all over the country who were aspiring in excellence and were like teaching me about myself. Um, the professors that really took time. Like I remember I had a um, psychology professor who was just taking a little extra time to, to show me who I was as a black man mm -hmm. and to, and to help set the standard and, and to keep those values. I think those are the invaluable things that we, that you can't get it at, you know, um, a, a school that is in the HBCU. And I'm so grateful that my daughter ended up going to Howard. Oh, um, yeah. And like her friends went to, you know, her friends, one of her best friends went to Hampton. I, and I just saw a, a young NBA, um, a young NBA yep. prospect, just um, mm -hmm. high schooler, one of the top players in the nation deciding to go to Howard. It's a powerful thing. Like I, I think, man, if, if you're a young person, I was talking to some of my friends so the kids from my foundation, they were, they were actually some of the uh, alum was talking to the younger one, younger ones saying how great the experience is going to a black college and, and just having that support, mm -hmm. like because it, it is tough for a lot of students mm -hmm. that end up going to you know predominantly white universities, trying to establish this black organization or black club so they can feel embraced um, on a, such a big campus. But I'm a you know I'm a advocate for HBCUs all day. Uh, Dead Prez met at FAMU, and Phil Agnew, who started the Dream Defenders, he started at FAMU. So there's a lot of a lot of yeah. energy there. Yes, sir. Yo, yeah, De um, Stick. I used to see Stick rhyming because I think he actually is from Tallahassee too. Yeah. Stick would be rhyming in talent shows, and I, you know he's a couple years younger than me. But I was like, this dude is dope. He was, I think he was still in high school. He, man, he was rhyming then. So, yeah, yeah. you're right. The HBCUs produced. Um, Will Packer went to FAMU. Yeah. And, yep. uh, yeah. And, and Y'all know Howard produced a lot of greats. Yeah. Um, you named an album Nobody Smiling because of how the violence in Chicago can sort of snatch the happiness out of the communities. On Respiration, you predict the effects of gentrification when you're talking about tearing down the Jex Create and Plush Homes. The first time I ever heard the term Wild Hundreds was on a common record. How do you feel like the violence in Chicago is being weaponized in political conversations? Well, I mean, it's crazy you say that. I was just, I hadn't turned on the TV since we've been here and mm -hmm. the TV was on when I was walking past and uh, they were talking about some of the violence that just happened in Chicago and they would talk about it in an exploitive way where, you know, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. these politicians and I, the, um, I don't even want to say his name, but, you know, like the, the leader of this country, they, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll just like exploit that for, for political purposes and reasons mm -hmm. why they should, oh, this is why we should have the National Guard here, or this is what I'm going to, it's no real care or no real um, understanding or no real true wanting to see that our city heal, wanting to see our city be better. Um, so I feel that they just do it, obviously, for their own political gain, whichever way they can, whatever way it's, it benefits them. Um, and, you know, like, I mean, we've seen how this president just uses anybody or anything to advance himself, which mm -hmm. is, you know, the opposite of what we want in a leader because leaders are not the ones that's, you know, a leader can't be always thinking of themselves. And, um, you know, a leader got to think of the people that they serve and, mm -hmm. and the people that they should be leading. So anyway, mm -hmm. these politicians, you know, and I don't want to say all politicians because, you know, I, Kim Kim Fox is the state's attorney in in, in Chicago and, and she is incredible. She's from Cabrini mm -hmm. Green, state's attorney. And um, and um, she's just incredible. So I, I know it's mm -hmm. some people out there, but, you know, the people that we know that we see like. You know, like the the presidents, and the president of the United States, and people like mm -hmm. that. They not for us. We know that, and we and we, you know, we kind of. Mm -hmm. I look at it like this, y'all. I look at it like we can't we can't depend on them. And I'm saying we as black and brown communities in Chicago, mm -hmm. we can't depend on them to to take care of us and heal us. Mm -hmm. um, that's gonna be something we have to do um, holistically too, like on a whole level. And I and I do want to say, man, I'm. I'm I'm sad that my city is, is, you know, it's, it's children being shot and killed. Right. You know, it's people, innocent people. I don't want to see any human being lose their life. So, you know, it's something we got to work on. But these politicians, you know, it's, it's game for them. It's just exploitation. Right. Now, let's go back to the music for a second. 
um, you talked to us a little bit about how you were reading books and like, opening your mind. And I feel like that you had this creative growth because of the book reading from the time you came out with Can I Borrow a Dollar to the Resurrection album. I mean, I feel like as an artist, you grew in public by leaps and bounds. And there's this record on Resurrection, I Used to Love Her, in my opinion, and I think my opinion is valuable on this subject, it's almost the perfect hip-hop song. You use extended metaphor hip-hop as a woman. Um, this is a genius, genius technique. Um, later on, The Roots did the song Act Two, Love of My Life, which that's the song that made Black Thought, like, well, I was like, oh my goodness. The verse that Black Thought did on that song, and your verse, but it was like building on your song. Then the movie Brown Sugar comes out, and Brown Sugar is about, you know, Dream Hampton's life, but it's largely, to me, inspired by I Used to Love Her and inspired by Act Two, and then you and Erica Badu had Love of My Life, which is also inspired by that same song. Um, tell me about what made you make I Used to Love Her, and did you know that it was going to inspire this much creativity from other artists? Well, thanks for the love on the song, but I, I you know, I was writing I Used to Love Her. I was... First of all, when I released Can I Borrow a Dollar, you know, I knew I had to get better. I knew I was like, I mean, I, I put out what I put out and it was like one of those moments where you're like, okay, the world is not paying attention. You got to <laughs> you gotta work on your craft, man. Okay. And, um, I just really started working on my craft and getting better. And like at the time I was listening to John Coltrane and reading mm -hmm. and, and just like, that's when I started to grow into who I was and starting to learn and think more for myself. Mm -hmm. Listen to Midnight Marauders and yeah. you know, Souls of Mischief and and then Nas like on on um Stretching Bobito show just all this stuff was leading me to to improving it as an MC and I and I was freestyling with these cats that we used to that No ID had brought around we would just we would always be rhyming like we were sharpening each other and 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 that led me to to definitely feeling like okay I'm getting better I'm getting there. Um, when Dion made, when No ID made the beat for I used to love, I remember being like, "Yo, this beat is, I loved it." Like, cause I'm, I love like jazz, soulful music. Like, yeah, uh, you know, I, I just love it. I come, you know, I grew up going to church, and I just many rippets in my babysitters listen to us. So I just love soul, mm -hmm. soul music, Earth, Wind, and Fire. So, I when when he sampled this George Benson joint, I was like, "Oh, this is dope." But what what sparked me to write I used to love her, to be honest, was I was really looking at some of the East Coast and West Coast. Really, it was some East Coast artists that started imitating, imitating um, some of the West Coast artists. And I was mm -hmm. like, "No, this is not what. Please don't, don't, don't do that." Because like, I always loved how what hip hop. Like, if I didn't have to even go to Brooklyn to know what Brooklyn was like, because you mm -hmm. all paint pictures of Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Like right. I knew where Queensbridge was because Nas was able to paint pictures, and I would. Mm -hmm. It's like tribes. Like I knew what Compton was because of Ice Cube and, and MC8, Compton's mm -hmm. Most Wanted. I knew what these places were, and I was like, man, we. I don't want to see East Coast artists try to be West Coast um, right. because it, it takes away from like it's because really the motive of it seemed purely about like record sales, and I and. It's something that when I was writing that song, I was like, man, it's about this culture. It's about the art form. You staying pure and true to that. Yeah. So I looked at my, you know, as a hip hop purist, I was like, <laughs> man, I just want the art to, to stay true to what it is. And, and so I, I wrote the, I remember sitting in my in my apartment. I was staying with, with one of my guys, Rasan. We was we were staying in High Park. And man, my boys had just left. They they had just got through um they was they were smoking some weed. I was drinking a little bit. Of, I didn't drink too much that night. I remember, <laughs> and I was playing that beat, and I, man, I said, "Man, what if I make hip hop a girl?" And then I just, man, it was one of the quickest songs I wrote, and and that's my same roommate Rasan. I remember laying it down in the studio, and he was listening the whole time. And this is how immature we was at this point. He, when he thought I was talking about a girl, he was frowning. Like I, I was watching him as I was rapping. I was watching him through the booth. He frowning okay. like, why is he talking about this girl? Blah blah blah. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then, like you know, like because we young dudes, you know, we just it just it was a love song. Right. And he like, why is he doing? Why is he doing this love song? Right. And, that ain't gangster. <laughs> that yeah. That that ain't you know. That ain't care rest. That ain't right. like rock kill. That you know. But then, as soon as I got to the last line, it was like. Who I'm talking about, y'all, is hip hop. 
he just was like, oh my God. Oh, you know, <laughs> I, he bust his head over. Like, I still remember that reaction. And I'm saying that to say, mm. I felt the song would, would, would get some people with, with, you know, you never know what, you know, I never had an idea that they would base a movie on the song or, mm-hmm. you know, we would be going out like, to be honest, Love of My Life with Erica was the first um, Grammy that I ever mm-hmm. won. And, and it was just, you never, you don't even vision when, when you're writing, you're not even thinking about like, okay, this, these things can go to this level. You just really wanting to be heard. Like, I wanted yeah. people to, to be, the reason I call that album Resurrection is because I've I was like, I felt like I was coming from the dead. Like nobody mm-hmm. knew who I was. Um, and, you know, I wanted to put Chicago on the map. I wanted to be recognized. I wanted De La Soul to know I existed, you know, yeah. so all those things. Do you want to like, be an MC? You know what I'm saying? So, so anyway, it was an honor. It's funny you say something about, I never knew that Dream Hampton story. I, I never knew that, that um, Brown Sugar was somewhat based on Jim Hampton. I might have got that wrong, but I think I heard that Sanaa Lathan's character was formed around, the journalist character was formed around yeah. some, of, some of the Dream Hampton oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. I can, I can believe that, yeah. But it was but definitely influenced fuck. by your song. It was definitely like telling the story of that song. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, the writer, Mike Elliott, actually came to me to write some other things previously. You remember that? Um, um, well, of course you remember it. The thing that, it was called Carmen the Hip Hop. The thing that most in Beyonce. Yeah, Carmen Hip Hop Hip Hop 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 Yeah, Carmen Hip Hop. That's when. They, that's when the era. That was the era when all the girls was wearing their they pants hanging off their ass. Yes, see with just the, the, the top of their butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, every every girl in that movie had it had a dong showing out. They yeah. out their jeans. That was, that was the era. Oh man. <laughs> did, did, you, did you not like that era? Quiet, did you I love that? that era. <laughs> I had no problem with that era. That's why I remember. That's the. That was my main takeaway from that movie. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to so wear that, my jeans yeah. like that, but I wanted to. So he actually had come to me to write on that movie, but I wasn't ready yet. I was like, nah, I mean, I I just, I was still focusing on making an album and I just mm. didn't, wasn't thinking about it from that perspective. So when Brown Sugar came and they, they actually screened the movie for me and Erica because um, they wanted her to do a song or us to do a song, and I was like, yo. I was watching a movie like, yo, this thing is based on I used to love her pretty much. Right. And when they mentioned, when they mentioned the song in the movie, I was just like, damn, they talking about me in a movie. I'm, wow. I can't believe it. Like, <laughs> right. you know, it was, it, you know, when you quiet, you, I don't know when you started writing. I don't know if you knew how far you would go, like mm-hmm. to to be doing the things you're doing. But I must say, like, I didn't know to dream big till later. Like, I, mm. I just was really wanting to be heard. I had dreams. It was, the seeds were there. The dreams was there because I, want, I wanted to be an MC. So that's a dream. And I wanted to be like out there making records. But to know the extents that we're taking it now, I mean, you and I have sat down in the White House <laughs> with, mm. with, with President Obama. Right. Like who would have thought hip hop would take us there, man? Right, because of these bars. Right. There was also a little drama surrounding the I, I Used to Love Her when um you mentioned about uh some gangster rappers and you and we had Ice Cube on and he talked about the drama and was saying how happy he was it was squashed. And um he said he saw yeah. Common after that and didn't feel any animosity. It was a genuine love and when he was genuinely happy to be past that point, I don't even think about that beef. It was a dark moment in my career. Common is a good dude. I don't think he deserved it. How did you feel going through that situation? I, I, when I first heard the diss I was actually sitting in the car with my same homie Rasan <laughs> and King and King T, King T, and um, who's a West Coast rapper. And we were going to, I think it was an alcoholic show. We were just at an alcoholic show, and King T came into the car. We were listening to it, <clears throat> and I was like, I was hurt, but I also was happy that Cube knew who I was. <laughs> 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 I was like, damn, Ice Cube know who I am. This shit is incredible. <laughs> but then I also was like, man, man, this dude dissed me. So then I was like, I also felt, man, why did why did he think I was dissing the West Coast? Because I got love for them. Like I showed some of their covers in the in the video. Like NWA specifically, Ice Cube was you know one, one of my favorites, and still to this day is one of the greatest you know artists to do. Mm-hmm. music and do hip hop music and tell stories. He's a great storyteller. So I was surprised that he dissed me to be honest, but still I, it was mixed emotions like um and then 
I only decided to to do the diss record when when um I saw them on BET and they were like talking to Big Les and they was like, yeah, common, you know. And I was like, man, they keep going at me and I'm not like, I ain't no punk now. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know <laughs> I'm about love and but I ain't no punk. So I remember sitting down in my room. I mean, I had an apartment. I had this basement apartment. I just bought a building and and um and I was I set up a basement apartment. I used to have my records. KRS put out these instrumentals. Um and I put on this KRS instrumental and man, I just wrote the bitch in you and I wrote the first verse and I was like, man, I'm about to, you know, I'm going at it. And I and I I was going I was out there rapping that verse. I would be out with De La Soul and they would just we would stop the show and I would rap that verse. And I did it at, at the House of Blues in LA. And the crowd was giving me love. I was like, ready. I didn't know what was going to go down. But I just, at a certain point, I just got stirred up and got caught up in it. And I was like, whatever happened is going to happen. But um, so I did that. And that's what made me write a second verse to it. Then I was trying to find a a, a producer to, to create, you know, the song mm-hmm. with. And no, I didn't really want to do it. I don't think he, because he's in a nation of Islam. He kind of was mm-hmm. like. And Premier, I, Premier definitely wasn't gonna do it. I was trying to get right. to Premier, but I ended up. P Rock, P Rock, um, said, "Yeah, he'll do it." We went to his basement. Me and Black Thought. We went to P Rock's basement. He hooked up that beat, and I was like, "Yo, we going with it." <laughs> and I used to do it, and uh, you know, eventually, as Cube said, we just got cool. Minister Farrakhan squashed the beef. Mm-hmm. This is right after Biggie and Pac had died. God bless th- those brothers' souls. We all had this meeting. It was all this, like, Goody Ma, Fat Joe, Ice Cube, all of us. And he was like, man, basically like, man, y'all y'all becoming victims of the Willie Lynch letter. Y'all like wow. going at each other for for what reason? For, right. East Coast, West Coast, like, you know. And then I knew Q was a good dude. He knew I was a good dude. Later on, 20 years, not 20 years, but some maybe 20 years later, I get to be in his film, um, the barbershop yeah. mm. film. Making like, songs with him. You made a song for the film and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yo, what's crazy is we were about to talk about it on set. Like, we was about to have a real, like, man, what I was feeling was you were feeling. As mm. soon as we started, his phone rang. <laughs> and we never talked about it after that. So <laughs> it was all love, man. I mean, I got nothing but love for Ice Cube. He one of our greatest. He a great yes. man, a great leader. And just a cool dude. Yeah, and I saw that interview when, that y'all did with him. I, I was kind of, I, I was moved that he was like, man, Common ain't deserve that. Yeah. But, you know, everything is not just we grow. I'm glad we both can be here to talk about how we grew through it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what beef can be at times. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you get through it. Like you, 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 you're in that emotional state mm-hmm. and you may say, man, let me get past this. You know, yeah. let me be an adult. Yeah. My favorite thing that he said about in that interview is when, when I asked him why he did it, he said, I thought I heard something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Ice Cube right there, right? Yeah, I, I mean, thought I heard no something. Pump. Yeah, I thought yeah. I heard something, so I, I spoke on it. Um, yeah. now you mentioned you, you, you mentioned No Idea a couple of times, so I just want to take the time before we go any further to shout out Doug Infinite, Twilight Tone, uh, yeah. No ID, the, the producers who were the architects of your the early part of your career. Because me, for me, Sonically, what you did, obviously you're a great lyricist, but sonically, um, what you did was was very inspirational as well with those albums. Yo, give thanks. Yeah, No ID, Twilight, and then Doug Inf came in like around the third album and we was cooking mm-hmm. up. But No ID and, and Twilight really set the sound for me. Like the they created a sound and, and they mm-hmm. were evolving too, man. Like because after I, my first album, we only had, we were only, sam- they were only sampling records that we had access to, meaning, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't have a lot of money to go buy a bunch of records. So it was like people's father's records and these mm-hmm. things. So after that first album, that's when they really started being able to go to like those record buying stores, right. collection stores. And, and man, they were really digging. And we got introduced to the beat nuts and all that stuff in the, in the, mm-hmm. between the first and the second album. And, um, man, no, they're actually doing the first album I met the beat nuts. And, but, I watched them grow and they really two of the most talented and Doug and once Doug came on like Doug was pure hip hop he was like all we doing is this this he all he wanted was like the raw like gritty 
Primo mm-hmm. was one of his favorites. I could, I knew it, and uh, mm-hmm. so he loved those type of beats, and he was able to create that. Him and No ID did a lot of great stuff together too. So those are some of my favorite. They still my brothers and some mm-hmm. of my, you know, favorite yeah. guys. You know, just they, they started me off, so I always loved them, brothers. No doubt. More than once, you've made what I consider one of the greatest hip hop songs. We talked about I used to love her, um, but let's also talk about a song for Asada, which is dedicated to Asada Shakur. Asada Shakur is one of our um, uh, most beloved revolutionaries and figures in the struggle for our black lives and the movement for black lives. Um, she is central to the black power movement. She is uh, living in Cuba in exile after escaping prison uh, for, you know, she got shot and then she was accused of murdering a cop. Um, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement is a organization that took us to Cuba we went on separate trips, but we both went to meet Asada Shakur. They gave us political education before we would do their events. We would perform at the Black August events. Um, tell me about meeting Asada and tell me about how receiving the political education from the Malcolm X grassroots movement impacted your career and your life. Yeah, that was, man, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, that was like very powerful for me because it was the first time that I felt like I was being organize I was being part of an organization that was doing work like that was actually doing real work and mm-hmm. and you know it was I read the books and mm-hmm. I was speaking them musically and I felt like I was doing certain things on a conscious side but I felt like seeing being part of the Malcolm X grassroots movement or supporting that and them taking us to Cuba I was like man I'm you know I'm starting to do what what I seen, you know, like the the, the yeah. Marvin Gaye's or the and the Harry Belafonte's and Nina Simone's and and those mm-hmm. artists, you know, um, that stood up, which I didn't know at the time, but even you know Sam Cooke, all these artists that really like were were being activists in ways and showing up for the for movements. So mm-hmm. and th- and their political education was like, I felt like man, I gotta, I was so grateful f- to get the information and be around, and it felt like I was surrounded by just wise people who were really for our people and really mm. tr- striving to do good. So, I, you know, when they took me to Cuba, I felt it, it was rewarding for me. And it was also a blessing because it, it led me to say, man, I'd already read Asada's book, but I want to go back mm. to Cuba and see if I can get in tune with Asada. And that kind of, mm. it started that path because I met people in Cuba when we went to perform the first time. So I decided to write this book, I mean, write this song, because I read Asada's book over and over. And actually, mm-hmm. my daughter, Moye, her middle name is Asada. Um, and and I was like, man, I'm going to write this song, and I'm going to see if I can get Asada on this song. Like, just, you know, I just wanted to, to I wanted to ha- have a voice. Um, yeah. So I was able to connect with her. It was such a blessing to meet her because, you know, not only is she one of my heroes, but... It, it taught me that you could be a revolutionary and still have fun. Because when I met her, we were down there, like, enjoying yeah. ourselves. You know, she was rapping. She freestyled with me. You know, like, yeah, she's she vibrant. freestyled. Yeah, she's vibrant, man. She got an energy. And it was just, like, it was so eye-opening for me. And, I, you know, it's it's rare that you think that you will meet somebody of that that you respect and honor and love so much. You know that did you because they you figure they in exile in Cuba. Yeah. But it happened. And um I'm grateful. Like she ended up talking on the song. CeeLo sang that hook. And uh man, to this day, some people come up to me and be like, Man, I started learning who Asada was because of your song. And That's you right. know, and and now she's impacted their lives the way she's impacted us, Qua and, and so many others. Right. So I mean it's it's a powerful thing. It's the, the the thing that hurts me about that though is that I funny enough, I was doing a film and I was playing like somebody that was like an undercover um FBI police guy. And mm-hmm. we had somebody from the FBI sitting at this dinner table and they was talking mm-hmm. about who's on the most wanted list. And they was mm-hmm. like, Yeah, this woman Joanne Chester Moss. Mm-hmm. This is like twenty eighteen. I said, wow. What? Like she, she was number. She brought this FBI agent brought her up, Joanne Chester Marsh Asada. Yep. Like first, up. first said, woman, first woman ever on the list, I think. And the they, the bounty for Asada is two million dollars. 
Man, it's so ridiculous, man. Like with all this stuff that is going on in, in this country, that you actually have her on the most wanted list, and like it, it, it's it's just ridiculous. It's crazy. And um, you know, like see, I I know from meeting her, and I haven't talked to her in in years, but from meeting her, she was happy with where she was, mm -hmm. but as she said, it's not you know nothing like seeing your people. She grew up in North Carolina. She. It's nothing like seeing your people and just the taste of fried chicken, you know, and just <laughs> certain right. things. It's just black American. And, um, right. you know, but I love her. I've been inspired by her. She's still shaping, helping shape our lives. Yes. I read something she wrote just recently. Um, and I was like, man, this woman is just, she's incredible. Like, her, as a writer, she's incredible. So I love her. Yeah. Yeah. Rest in peace to Nahanda Abby Odun. Uh, yeah. as well, who was down there with her. And that was our, our tour guide there. Um, talk to me about Electric Lady because you and me, we met each other um, earlier than that, but we were both working on albums in Electric Lady. I was working on Reflection Eternal on the top floor. You was working on Like uh, like Water for Chocolate with Dilla on the second floor. Uh, Amir and Pino Palladino and James Poyser and uh, D'Angelo were working on Voodoo on the bottom floor. Um, to me, I feel like you need a kitchen to cook it. And Electric yeah. Lady was like our, our kitchen. So describe the vibe for the people. Yeah, man, that that vibe, that place is like no other, to be honest, man. I mean, I've been in studios all around the, the world. Um, and it's something about whatever Jimi Hendrix created that way. He created that with a lot of love and just Yeah, he built and, that studio and, for the uh, audience. Yeah, and, that, and the artistry that's been there... Um, you know, us being like being in that space, that kitchen, as you said, being in that and having that collective of artists, it created some of the richest music ever, some of the most profound and beautiful music that ever, man. And um, it's something to be able to go upstairs and hear what you're working on, or you know, and then Amir says, pop into this session, and you see what D'Angelo is working on, and then Erica. Badu comes comes around and we sparking things up and then Bilal and, and man it yeah. just was most it just was like yeah. and then Dave Dave Chappelle would come to some some of the studio sessions That's right. and then we go now we go. I met I met I met Dave Chappelle in in Ohio at Kent 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 Kenyon College but I saw Dave Chappelle and his uh, future wife Elaine walking down the street I had gone outside because I was going to Fat Beats to go buy a piece of vinyl. And I ran into Dave Chappelle and he said, what you doing? I said, I'm right there in the studio. And that's how he came in the studio that day. Oh, wow. What? You just yeah. saw him on the... Damn. I just saw him on the street. <laughs> and he came every day. He came every day after that. Dude, that was... Yo, that's, you know, that's just divine order, man. Things mm -hmm. that's supposed to happen because you going out just for... We was just about to go to Fat Beats? Yeah, I was about to go to Fat Beats. Damn. And now look at this. We are we out here at Dave Chappelle's like in Yellow Springs. Like, right, but right, right. Yeah, but it was dope. It was dope to be in those sessions, like even from the, the points of people like Dream Hampton would come by. It's like to me, it was it was really like a collective of different minds and and artists coming around and and it inspired you, man. It was just like mm -hmm. I, I mean, I go back there now and still record sometimes, but the truth mm -hmm. of the matter is we're looking to create, as we said, let's create something like where we can have a kitchen now that's, that, that'll be that's our right. electric lady of, of this day and age. That's right. That's right. Where does, where does Bond? Mm -hmm. um, now, Jay Dilla, you developed a close working relationship uh, with him at this time. Dilla made the beat for one of your biggest songs, Delight. Um, when you heard that beat, um, did you realize how big that song would be? You know what? I, I felt like this song, you you know, you ever listen to some music and it takes you like it gives you an out of body experience. Like you feel mm. like, man, this mm -hmm. is I got. I was getting like that feeling of it was certain it's certain pieces of music that make me feel like, like it, it make my soul jump. I'm like, oh my god, this is incredible. It's it's an overwhelming feeling. I heard I heard when when Dilla played me the light. It wasn't even exactly the way it was. Now it was it was. A song that, um, and he just, you know, he had the beat. And honestly, I think at one point he was about to send it to Fife or whatever. And then um, mm -hmm. he was like, oh man, yo, you could you could use this. And then I was like, what's that? What's that? He's like, yo, you could use this. He's like, let me redo it. And he just 
redid it, man. He put put the drums that he put on there. And right. I can remember being in um Brooklyn. I was I was staying at, at my um she she was a her name was Andrea, God bless her soul. She was the international rep for our record label. I was standing, I was when I first moved to Brooklyn, I, I, I came to Brooklyn with like two weeks worth of clothing. I thought I was gonna go back and forth, Chicago to Brooklyn. Right. Ended up staying there. Me and Derek and my cousin Ajale, God rest his soul too. Rest um, in peace to Ajale. That brother's eyes. missed. Yes, yes. So I I remember like being in her apartment, going down the stairs, and and I had that beat on and I was listening to it in my headphones. And I started writing about, I never knew a la, la, la. I just, mm. you know, started coming up with that. And then I was like, man, this song felt, it felt like heartfelt. Mm. It was beautiful for me once we put it out. To, to, f- first of all, Amir told me just last week, no, la- about last month, that he was going to try to talk me into taking the light off off the album because wow. he didn't think it fit. <laughs> yeah. I was like, bro, you want to always go. Go. meddling. Yeah, meddling. <laughs> and, and another thing is, because we sampled that song, they wanted 100, they took 100% of the publishing. They wanted Right. So my lawyers was actually trying to talk me into not using the song. And I was like, no, I'm using this song. Yeah, and, give, and them they, give them their coins, give them their bread. Like, let's yeah, rock. Give them, I mean, yeah, like, look, you know, t- and to this day, I'm glad I followed my heart on that. It was the first song that, to answer your question, I guess I didn't know that it would get to that level because I didn't have records that was on the radio, to be honest, up to that point. Mm, right. And and this this song got to like pop radio, and I, that was just a new thing for me. It was the first time I seen young black girls singing my song, like yeah. you know, you know, like girls that were maybe thirteen <laughs> to fourteen right. who, who weren't who weren't listening to yeah jazz, yeah. <laughs> like right, 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 like. <laughs> you know, when jazz is, you know, that age, it's like, right, right, right. It, it was amazing. It was amazing. That, that touched my, that touched my heart, man, because I was, I was like, wow. Like, cause they, they didn't, they weren't into common like that before that. Like, because, you know, I'm just a hip hop dude to them. Right. But that song, like touched, it touched them. And mm-hmm. I remember doing radio, um, summer jams and stuff. And I was like. I remember telling my friends like, "Yo, this is the first song I had like young black girls singing my song, and it right, felt great." Right, because before so. that, before that, you was like, "Fuck, ladies, this is rip a motherfucking night." <laughs> night. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, think- you ain't gonna get the ladies. You ain't gonna get the ladies rocking with you saying that. Fuck, some, ladies, some this is rip a motherfucking rock. night. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for not listening to the naysayers and making that song because you're right. It is a beautiful song in it. You write, you want to be the one to make you the happiest and the hurt you the most. And the sort of honesty about relationships in a rap song. And it kind of pegged you as being this, uh, masculine sensitive rap dude. Was that like your intention (laughs) or is that just like who you are deep down? I think it's just, who I am, um, and you know, I was. It was my love for, like, I actually was writing that song with. I had a person in mind, but I also was using imagination because that relationship hadn't cultivated. Mm. <laughs> so it was like a lot of things that that we do. I mean, it was by do I had by do in mind, and, mm. and okay, yeah, yeah, but it also was like. None of the stuff I was talking about was really we, had we reached that level. So you know, like with many songs, you you could root them in something truthful, and mm-hmm. then you you know you use your creativity and imagination to take it to places. And that's really what I did with the song. And I was just being honest with where I was at the time. Like um, I, I never, I'm grateful that I grew up around people who you could just you could be yourself. Now they're gonna talk about you, they're gonna joke on you and, and sing on you and stuff. You. You got fun, but you could be yourself. So mm-hmm. I'm a person that is, you know, like I'm a caring human being. I'm also a real nigga too. So it's right. like, like I'm a I'm a man, and I and but I felt like it's okay for me to express myself in this way, and I'm okay with like whoever come. You know, I guess I felt like 
if anybody got something to say, then they can bring it. But they ain't that, you know. Why, <laughs> why you go battle me because I'm talking about love or talk talk crap? <laughs> I mean, I know cats always be like, yo, certain stuff is out of soft and this. But I guess I grew out of that thinking. Like I said, the difference between me doing, I used to love him, my homie being like, why is he doing a love song? To me doing the light and like, yeah, this right. is a love song to a woman. Right. Like, unapologetic. I grew yeah, unapologetic. So it was it. You know what, Jazz? I felt good being a black man, being able to express that, um, like that sensitivity towards mm-hmm. women and and to uplift women. And you know, y'all did that too, Qua. You know, like y'all mm-hmm. uplifted women, and and that and and that that's that shit is dope, man. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And yeah. I mean, I feel like that's what that's one of our duties as as men is as, in in our communities and and in culture and in our families. We we supposed to respect and honor and lift up um, black women. And I felt like that's what that song was doing. It did it from a pure place. And to this day, you know, I think it's the reason that some women even know who Common is. <laughs> Word up. <laughs> it's important for rap songs to uplift women because, I mean, yeah, we love to be booty shakers and in and, and the strip club, but we also love to be loved. And black women need to yeah. be shown love. <laughs> yes. And, yes. I, and that's dope to hear you say, Jazz, because it's true. Yo, you still want to shake your booty and have fun and, like, you know, you want to dance and kick it and you could be sexual and be, but you also still can be respected mm-hmm. and, like, have integrity and be valued. And I think, you know, at one point, to be honest, I feel like we were letting the music kind of separate us. Um, and it wasn't the music, the mentality, like, well, if I do a conscious song, then that means I can't really, like, connect with these people over here. Right. But I mean, I think we all have grown to understand that, man, we are deep people. We people that got different emotions through the course of a day. I feel like, I mean, I, I read my scriptures, but I also want to drink and talk shit and curse, you know, and just have mm-hmm. fun. Yes. Um, and then, you know, I might sit down and talk to somebody about meditation. I might meditate. And then, you know, I might be out here just doing something silly, but it's it's all like it shows you know who we are as as human beings. We we're, we're round individual, whole individuals. So I, I, I'm glad to be able to express that in in our music, and I'm glad to hear you say that as far as a woman that you want to dance but be uplifted. Yes, that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, you and Dilla mm-hmm. were roommates during Dilla's last couple of years. Um, you connected musically. You were obviously uh, very close. Can you share maybe a story that you haven't shared about living with Dilla in his last days? Well, when we first, when Dilla and I first moved to LA, like, I mean, I was I was pretty much staying there already. And then um, I was like, man, Jay, you should come out here. Cause I knew he was dealing with um, a lot of stuff in Detroit and he was already dealing with like uh, the, the, um, the disease he had. Mm-hmm. And so, when he came out there, it just was like, I could see his energy being better. It, you know, it, it was like his whole spirit was getting better. But the mm-hmm. but the thing is, um, what was funny it was Dilla would always watch um, um, Jerry Springer at <laughs> every, like, every, I'd be coming home and that dude would be watching Jerry Springer. I'd be like, man, <laughs> you know, and then, uh, then he'd get right up and just get on that, on that drum machine and be making beats, man. And I remember us, like, I feel like I, I would go buy records and he was buying records, but I would like just buy all these soul records. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, to be honest, um, a lot of the stuff that for donuts, I think it was like just some of them soul records that I bought. Right. I mean, he started by, buying soul too, but it was like, I was only buying the stuff that I kind of knew or in mm-hmm. things I would come across. Um, and, you know, JD knew every, all so much music, but... Mm-hmm. It was dope to hear him go like down the soul record road. Like that whole album is a lot of soul records, Donuts mm-hmm. is, um, you know, with a few exceptions. And, you know, he made that in our front room, man. It was just incredible. Yeah. He made that in our front room and then somewhat from his hospital bed. And it was just incredible to um, to witness and just have my one of my closest friends just to be there with like him watching, watching him make these beats and being around and just being able to wake up and hear a Dilla beat like or see him 
on the drum machine was like, man, this is mm. amazing. You know, it's one of those things like we like we was talking quiet. Like sometimes yeah. you just appreciate the moment. I gotta say, I definitely appreciated the moment because I knew that he also was sick and and you know, I didn't know if he would make it. We didn't know if he was gonna make it or not. So mm. that was another dynamic that I probably never talked about that was hard. Um, because for me, it was the beginning of my like the album B had come out. Um like I was just starting my, I got my first film, um, Smoking Aces. So my life was like vibrant and I was moving mm. around and to see somebody you really close with, like really not like lo losing, pretty much losing their life in front of you. Um, man, it was hard, man. It was hard. Like I think, you know, I, I never, it took me time to deal with that and to understand that because you feel guilty, you feel different things like you don't you don't even want to come in and be like man I just did this because you see like it's painful for this brother to stand up um and it was mm -hmm. something man like it was something when I when he the day he passed I was coming from an audition and his mother called me and I was rolling down Detroit street and she mm -hmm. said yo he passed and I was just like mm -hmm. man you know yeah. You just felt it in the air. It was it was a, it was a tough, tough, a tough one, man. And still to this day, we know Dilla still lives through the through his art yes. and through his music. But but man, it's just you know that's somebody who I'm like man. In your 32 years of living, man, you did a lot, bro. You did a lot. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Rest in peace to Dilla. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. And yeah. rest in peace to yeah. Bob Ten too. Yeah, Bob Ten too, man. God bless Dilla. God bless by 10, so too. Yes, yes. At the time you performed with Erica Badu a lot, you guys were in a relationship, which has ended, but you guys have stayed really close. What is your secret to um, remaining close friendships with your exes? And not looking for gossip, just wisdom on the subject. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I think, you know, I think being able to to stay close like with with my ex girlfriends um has been about the way I treated them during the relationship and the way I end the relationship um or the way they end it, you know uh, <laughs> meaning I mean, it's like I feel like you know I'm, I'm not perfect but I think I give a sincerity and a truth and um usually if I'm ending a relationship with someone it, I'm going to be as honest as possible. And eventually, once they get past the hurt of it, or once I get past the hurt of it, then I can see that, okay, this is a good person. This is somebody mm -hmm. I valued in, in my life. Or I think that they can see that, you know, they value me in their lives, yeah. in their lives. And, um, and just because it's not in the same shape and form that it was before doesn't mean that um, we can't still be benefits to each other's lives. Like... Like per se, Erica, like Erica and I, I feel like that's a soul connection that'll be there forever. Um, but it didn't have to t only take the shape of being in a relationship, a mm -hmm. uh, romantic relationship. And now we can build each other up in different ways. And I've, you know, each person is different. I have different relationships with, but I will say most, of, you know, the majority of the ex girlfriends I have, you know, we still cool. It ain't, it ain't no, no love lost. Now, right. you know, to be real, like, the mother of my child, it took some time to grow through that because it's a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, it's a child involved and, and you know, it's just a different dynamic. That's all I can say. And I, and I really, honestly, you know, that taught me some lessons in like how I move forward. You know, if I, you know, if for me, it's like if I wanted to have more children, I would rather be married and be in that, in that space or be committed to a partner Cause I, cause I definitely <laughs> didn't want to be in the, in that situation again. So I think I just, you know, approach, I try to treat people like people, no matter what I, I, I strive to be better and, and work on forgiveness. Um, you know, and I, one of the things that's most important to me, you know, as much as career and art is, is working on myself. Mm -hmm. So I just try to work on myself. And I think that helps in, in the, in the long run of just being, people being able to respect you as an individual and see your integrity and see your value. Yes. Well, you've done it in fine fashion. Um, yeah, you keep great people around you though. Um, you've 
blessed me with being able to tour with you more than once. We toured on a Spit Kicker tour. You took me on an electric circus tour. You took me on a tour with you to Australia. And I've met some of my favorite musicians through touring with you, DJ Dummy, who introduced me to my first DJ, DJ Chaps. Um, Kareem yeah. Riggins was drumming yeah. with you on the road. Um, Omar Edwards was playing keys with you on the road and went on to be one of the most sought after MDs, keyboard players on the planet. Um, yeah. I, I brought Kanye West on the Electric Circus tour, and he was he was coming out and trying to take over my show. Um, <laughs> but but um, what made you want to sign with Good Music and work with Kanye uh, to that level? Well, you know what I felt like when I said, "Man, I, I I felt like I needed to humble myself to a certain degree," and at the same token. I felt at that point in my career was like a, it was a rebirth. I look at careers like like spirals, like a cycle going around. And like mm-hmm. you start at the beginning, like can I buy a dollar was one point. And as I went around that circle, I think Electric Circus was the end of that cycle. And then mm-hmm. work starting to work with Kanye was was the start of a new cycle, a new new spiral in his career. And being on the song with you and, and Ye, get him high was mm-hmm. it was ref- it was rebirth and refreshing for me because at that time I, when I released Electric Circus so many people were like man common fell off this is mm. what is it this ain't hip hop this is you know so that was the first time I took that much like criticism even from the critics you know you know usually even if I released the album and it wasn't getting like the radio play I would still get the hip hop love like the the bass crowd the community Still was like, yo, common is dope, or right, yeah, we rocking with you. That one was like, it 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 shook the house, man. Cast was like, mm-hmm. man, we ain't rocking with this. So, <laughs> so for me, I was like really looking for what what's the next plateau for me? How am I going to continue to grow as a music artist? And man, Ye had always been around saying, I got beats, I got beats. But initially, when he first was doing that. It was this was like when he was 19 and no ID was right there, like kind of mentoring him and showing him stuff. So it, for me, it was like, man, the beats is cool. You got good beats, but I'm here with a master right now, and his right. and his sound a little more at the level. So I didn't never right. I never worked with Ye like out there. I, I took some beats. He would come around and rhyme with me. Um, we and we he would come to my basement and we'd be rhyming and stuff. But we I never used any of his beats. So. During in 2003, after Get Him High, we was, uh, or maybe it might have been around the time of Get Him High, we, um, he was just making beats and then he was like, Yo, you want this? And I was like, Yes. And then I started working with him. And as I worked with him, I was like, This is what I need. So I decided, I said, Yo, I want to be a part of good music. Mm -hmm. I approached him. I said, You know what? I'll release this album on good music. And he was like, Yes. And he wrote something in this little table book he had that was really kind of defined what a good partnership is about in anything. And he said, you know, basically it's when you bring something to the table and they're bringing something to the table. Like what I think he knew was like, I had a, a name in, in hip hop and a, a foundation and a credibility. Um, and he obviously had the gift of being a genius um, producer and visionary when it came to just making the music. So I think what we both brought together, I saw the value in it and I saw that it would be great. I, you know, I knew that it would be great to be a part of that, of Ye's like collective and vision and he was going to push it hard. Um, and yo, man, it just, you know, it turned out to be a great partnership, man. And that's still for me, one of the best um, producers and talents I ever been able to work with. And he supported my music. I always feel loyal to Kanye because he supported me in different ways. It was a, it was a tough. That was a tough period for me. Like mm-hmm. it was like right after I had a, um, Eric and I broke up. Electric Circus ain't really jumping off the way I, you know, I thought I was gonna come do some like fresh outcast like new sound <laughs> stuff. You know, people right. was like, "Nah, we not, we not, nah. doing, we not rocking." <laughs> so. It, so it was one of those times and and he was right there to just support me and create and man like i said the being you know quite like he's a producer like he yeah. gonna make sure that song is right he helping with the hooks he coming yeah like and that's a that's a that's a gift man and, and i understood 
you know, I learned more and more what, what producing is by working with Ye. So it was, mm -hmm. it's been dope. And that good music affiliation has been incredible. Now, I've been patient long enough. I have to acknowledge the elephant in the Zoom. Boom, boom. Ah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. Hey, you, you, should, you, should, you should come do stand up out here. And, uh, I'm way better at stand up, up than that just showed. I promise. I promise, guys. <laughs> Uh, all right. So speaking of Kanye, speaking of loyalty, you guys were together when Kanye let out his tweet and said he's going to be running for president 2020. We don't know if it was a joke because this is 2020. Like I said, and anything is possible. So this is question <laughs> is for both of you guys. What was your first impression? Second impression? Do you really think Kanye is going to win? Are you about to be on Kanye's uh, campaign team? What's going on? <laughs> Rush. Well, well, <laughs> well quiet deflected this. Uh let me say this. I'll say um first of all, you know, like I said, I support Kanye. That's my brother. I would like when I first saw that tweet um last night, uh it was one of those things that was I was like, yo, we are in a different time. Is this, you know, this for real? This is I want this Jay for real. And you know, I started thinking like we we need a leader and a president who really is politically adept um has knows what you know the world of politics but also is just like an incredible leader. Mm -hmm. Um I I feel like this ain't a time where like I I love Ye, that's my guy. I would have to sit down and talk with him and see what he is what is he's even thinking? But right mm -hmm. now, in my mind, I, I, we need another Obama. Mm -hmm. We need, I mean, I know it's not like just a, but we need, you know, somebody who's just going to be like, that's been in this political game to a certain degree, but still like just is for the people and cares for the people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm saying that to say, I would at least sit down and talk with Ye and see what he what he's on and if, and if he's mm -hmm. serious about this. But I still don't know if I'm like, Yo, I'm going out saying, yo, yay, go be president. <laughs> I really, what, what about you, Kwa? What about you? I'll put you in. Mean, I mean, um, back to what we were saying about Malcolm X grassroots movement. The important thing about working with organizations like that is that we received political education. And Kanye, for better or for worse, prides himself on not being adept at politics and not really knowing about politics. And he said it himself. So I'm not like outing him or trying to diss him or throwing him shade. He said when he was talking about slavery as a choice, he's wearing a MAGA hat. He was talking about energy. He was talking about how things felt. He's talking about emotions. He, 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 free. He freely admits that he's not informed on the issues. So I have to say that I do not support his decision. If he's, if he's serious, if he's not just trolling, I can't personally support it because he already told us he's not informed on the issues. Mm -hmm. um, do I think Kanye is talented enough, smart enough to, to turn it around, maybe figure it out? Yeah, Kanye has made mistakes that I didn't like, and he's he's turned it around very quickly. This mistake of supporting Trump, this is the longest, biggest mistake that he's made. I've been waiting the whole time for him to turn it around and he won't turn it around. He won't take off the goddamn MAGA hat. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I feel the same as Raj when it comes to what Kanye has done for my career and how Kanye supported me musically. Um, I That's something that is a nuance, something that you and me and, and Lupe and certain other people that work with Kanye, no matter how we might feel politically, we, we, we cannot change the fact that this man is very, very important to our careers and to just how we feed our family. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm yeah. saying? Um, so, but yeah, I, that's I can't. That's our brother. Yeah, that's, that's our, our brother. brother. I support yeah. him. I love him. But I mean, yeah. you know, I understand what you're saying. And I mean, mm. and like I said, I would sit down with him just to be like, yeah. yo, yeah, what you, what you, like, what's, what, what's your plan? Um, but we really need a leader. Let's be, let's, let's be honest, y'all. We need a leader that's like, on the next level when it comes to politics um and thinking and um and the people just simple as yeah. that and 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 like you, like Kwa said I think he's capable of doing a lot of things but it takes time to exactly. to dig into it just like how he developed his fashion and developed yeah. even as a producer it takes time you got to put in time to to get to that to that level of of leadership to be able to lead a country so yeah. you know I don't think Ye has had that experience I think that he should take on a smaller uh, 
role in politics first and maybe do that for the next four years and then come back and try and run. And I think that it's a lot of black people on my uh, social media that are like, I'm going to vote for Kanye. And it's like now See, it's, mm, it's messing up votes because that, mm, yeah, that 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 is where it's an issue. And then it's also crazy that people are writing like, oh, well, he's not a racist or a rapist. And I'm like, damn, is that all you don't have to be in order to be a president is not a rapist or a racist? I mean, that's a, that's that's a good start. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, let's, let's start with I didn't rape nobody and I'm not a racist. Let's yeah. let's just start at that baseline. Um, <laughs> but look, hey, but look, but look, hey, but Kwa, look uh, at how, look at how low our standard has been now for for leadership. Mm-hmm. Where we saying, let's start with the person <laughs> not being a rapist, right? And, and a Which racist. should be a given. Like yo, <laughs> yo, that, I mean, that shouldn't even be that shouldn't even be in the conversation. Mm-hmm. Like that, ain't, that's that's like you said, that should be a given, Jazz. It's like this, this has lowered our standard. The president that's in office now has lowered the standard so much. That it's like, man, we people w- willing to take anything, but we gotta remember, like, that we talking about leading, like these people. I mean, obviously on the state and local levels too, we gotta remember. That's one thing I want to say to everybody out there that's going out to vote, or if you're thinking about, it, even if you don't like some of the candidates, it's certain policies that that you may be behind or want to see change that you gotta go out and vote for those things mm-hmm. too. I'm gonna believe in like grassroots movement, community mm-hmm. work, and policy change. And I think, you know, yeah. as much as we look and say, OK, this president, you know, like this guy, because I know a lot of people like, man, I ain't rocking with Biden. Well, man, look, mm-hmm. look at what policies or things that you may want. See it. See where he is on it. And man, it might you vote for the policies, too, to a certain degree. And it's up to us. People like us, quiet and people who can get the ear of of a president to say, man, we got to, if we're going to give you any support, we're going to hold you accountable for these things that, that you say you're going to do. I know we get into the political talk, but that's where I am with it. And uh, man, I'm, I mean, I used to be a guy that didn't even, I had no desire to be about around politics or any of that, but I see how much it affects our daily lives. So I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I'm more, I'm more aggressive about it and just, a more part of it. No doubt. No doubt. Um, let's pivot a little bit to movies. Uh, I watched you really sort of put your career musically to the side and really take on the Hollywood, the, the acting. I went out there for auditions. I tried to follow your lead at, at one point. I was like, I seen how you was doing. I was like, I'm going to be like common. I'm going to get into movies and everything like that. And I would go on these auditions and the process of going to audition was so disheartening. I realized sitting in that room, looking at the other actors in the room, I was like, I didn't put in the work. And I was like, I, I watched Common put in the work. Um, you putting in that work got you, man, it got you to working on Hell on Wheels and The Shy and the TV space. There's so many great movies. I loved watching you in, in Smoking Aces. Um, Thank but, you. Thanks. But, but what I want to ask you is in, in Smoking Aces, whether Smoking Aces, Terminator Salvation, or even Suicide Squad, you, nice guy Common, let love rule common. You play a lot of fucking tough guys and gangsters, my nigga. And uh, yeah. <laughs> what is it? What is it? What is it, what is it about you on screen that makes directors lean towards wanting to cast you as tough guy, the muscle? What do you think it is? Well, I'm gonna be. Let me be clear. First, initially, I wanted to definitely play characters that were not. I didn't want to be Rashid on screen, like right. It. I mean, I. When I first began, like going to acting classes, studying acting, I loved that it, I was able to learn things about myself, express things, but also become these different characters. Like one of the the biggest joys for me as an actor is just like if I have to play a chef, I learn what it is to actually learn how to cook. I learn kind of walking these work, walking this person's footsteps, and it gives me another type of compassion and understanding for people. So I love that aspect about it um, in itself. And, you know, the first roles I was I was able to get in Smoking Aces, which, like you said, was a gangster dude. It was like I wanted to be able to do that because, you know, I didn't want to come out and be just do a love role or mm-hmm. like something. Right. You know, I wanted to do something that was different. And, and you know, and it was a great project for me to be a part of. So I, I felt I felt like, you know, I I grew up around what I grew up around. I have enough 
to be able to draw from, to be able to become this character. And um, then, you know, I started, I got cast a couple more and a couple more, like you mentioned, um, what was it called? Street Kings and, yeah. you know, even Terminator. In fact, I would say the first probably five or six movies I did, I was holding a gun in each one. And it right, was crazy you, because- He was robbing Tina Fey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Kidnapping Tina Fey, rather. So, Kidna- <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, at a certain point, I was like, I got to do something different. But the truth of the matter is I did want to play dark and different characters to start it off. Mm. And let's face it, Hollywood at a certain point, they just see, it, it, they was looking like black. He could play the heavy in, in this. Like, he's a right. black dude. He could play the gangster. Um you know, we 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 are breaking consistently breaking down those those ideas and concepts that the of them not really seeing black people as different types of people. Like mm. that's why you know I think it's so dope to have a like a show like Atlanta. Um, you know, oh man, Donald, great show. That that shit is that shit is dope. And then you know yeah. you have something like I don't know if y'all saw. Um, Chewing gum. You ever seen Chewing Gum? Yeah. The, 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 the sister, yeah. um, from Michaela England. Coel from from English. Yo, she's dope, and she's a writer and director. Well, she's a writer and a star of that show. But it's just a different quirky show. It's just like it just shows the diversity in who we are as, as black people, um, and and like how different we are, and we can come with those different. Like I want to be in the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind type of film. Okay. You know, I want to be in Charlie Kaufman, Shawshank Redemption, huh? Yeah, like Charlie Kaufman. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. Uh, the writer, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, you are a best-selling author twice over. Congratulations. Um, I sell a lot of your books at Inkiru Books. Go to qualityclub.com. Inkiru yeah. Books. You can buy Common's uh, recent book, Let Love Have the Last Word. Um, yeah. Now, this book in particular is very powerful because one of the big stories that came out of it where you opened up, you opened up about being molested as a child. Why did you feel the need at this point to share that truth as an adult? And have people been grateful that you threw open the door for black men to talk about sexual abuse in a more honest way? Yeah. Well, you know, it, man, for my whole life, I didn't even acknowledge that that had happened to me. I guess, you know, what I found out about myself throughout that process is my way of dealing with trauma is to it doesn't exist. Like I just block mm-hmm. it out. I so happened to be doing a movie um, called The Tale with Laura Dern, and the writer-director was a woman who had been um, sexually abused and molested. Uh, but she, at her her story was that she thought she was in a relationship with her coach. She was a 13-year-old girl, and to the point where, where when we were filming the movie, she thought that, like, yo, this was a relationship, and we were like, yo, you were molested. This dude was 40, mm-hmm. and he, you right. were 13. Anyway... Um, we were in one of the rehearsals and I told Laura Dern, I was like, yo, I think I was molested. I, this happened to me. And then, man, it was, it, it kind of sent me down the road of really like looking at myself. And I had already been like, I've gone to therapy before and like really been doing work on myself. So I was like, this is something I got to deal with. I got to right. like really, cause I had blocked this out of my, my, um, life and psyche mm. and I don't know how it's affected me. Mm. So, you know, I'm the I'm the type of person that I'm like, I'd rather if I got an issue, I want to bring it up and get rid of it, you know, as mm. much as I can. And so I yeah. that's how I felt like, let me let me work on this, figure this out and, and and you know, go through this process. And as I was writing the book, I hadn't put it in the book quite actually, but what I did was oh, okay. I started writing an album based around a book, inspired by the book. Oh, and the so Let Love. it's so funny. Let, yeah, the Let Love album. And then it's so crazy because I don't know, I feel like I've expressed so many things musically. Like I wasn't able to talk about it in the book before I started writing a song about it. I was writing a song mm-hmm. about it. And then I shared the song with, with this woman, Tamara, who's on my team. And she was like, man, she was like, man, you got to put it in the book. And I was like, you mm-hmm. know what? I do need to put this in the book because... It's something I knew that books are something that we sit down and have to read and deal with and you stop. The music is a different thing. Um, so I felt that I, I needed to put it in the book. I needed to 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 be able to deal with it. And really, the last thing you said is the the it was not only for me, but I felt like it was for other yeah. mm-hmm. people 
in in black communities, especially black men, but just in our communities, black and brown communities, to be honest, who mm. looked at that looked at those things as like you can't speak on it. And I was like, man, I want to see us heal from this because right. it's. Because when I, when I actually told my mother about it, like before the book came out, she told me that it was part of her life. She, some, something something mm-hmm. like that had, had happened to her, um, but mm-hmm. she, you know, she didn't get too deep into it. And I and I was like, man, me telling in my book and me talking about it is my way of hoping to stop the cycle. Because if my yeah. mother could say that something like that happened, I know that it's other people in my family that probably mm-hmm. experienced it. And I feel like as black people, we always taught to keep that quiet. Or mm-hmm. Uncle such and such, don't say nothing about that. And it's like, man, it's, it's, it's hurting us. It's damaging a lot of people. Um, so, you know, I feel like I'm going to go out there and say it. It's actually real f- freeing to be able to to open up and be like, man, this this happened. And, right. and this is who I am. And, and I feel like I'm able to be more of myself even more now because I'm learning myself and able to express it. And uh, you know, like I suggest, I, I suggest and, and, and encourage people who go through trauma to be able to have find resources to help them heal, whether it's therapy, meditation, all the above, spirituality, whatever things there may be. Um, mm-hmm. I think we need it. I think it's for me. That's part of my fight. When I look at what Trump and all these cats is doing, my way to to my way to battle that is to go out and, and create. Um, a better communities for us holistically too, like economic wise, socially, but also emotionally. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of the elements that I never used to think about. Like when I was talking about like what we, what we should do for the hoods and what we could do for our people. Mm-hmm. I never really thought about trauma and those things because we don't talk about it in our, in our communities. Yeah. I thank you for doing that. And I'm sure a lot of people, who have gone through that have thanked you for that. And it's a very yeah. loving action. And love has yeah. been a running theme. Um, love, compassion has been a running theme through your career. And um, it's beautiful uh, to see. And it's beautiful to be your friend, brother. Thank you. Um, Thank you. you and I are both mutual friends with Scott Budnick, uh, hip Hollywood producer from The Hangover and Just Mercy yeah. uh, more recently. Scott does incredible anti-recidivism work um, and a lot of prison reform adv- advocacy. I was blessed to go perform in a jail, in a prison with you because of Scott. Um, and man, that was such a uh, beautiful experience for me. Tell me more about your own criminal justice reform work. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like I read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And that really great book. like great book. Cri- you can find it at Incura Books. Incura <laughs> Books, go get it. Yeah. Yeah. If you go get that book, man. Um, it's funny when I went to do some, I went to do a a speaking engagement at Facebook, and that was part of their reading requirement was the um, the new Jim Crow, and wow. I was really happy to hear that they were actually trying to teach some of their you know brass about the, the criminal justice system. Anyway, reading that book, I had been approached by Scott many times to to actually come to his. Um, weekend events where he had, you know, where he was working with those who were incarcerated. But at the time, I, that wasn't like, it didn't, that wasn't my mission. I was, you know, I was like, man, I'm about fixing up these neighborhoods and making sure our communities are right. And then when I, I got to sit down with Michelle Alexander, she said, you understand that the prison system is one of the causes of why your neighborhoods are, are as bad as they are. And then she just broke right. it down, like fathers getting removed from the homes, um, people coming back and not being able to get jobs and get get housing and not being really actually healed. And, and the prison system is not about healing. It's, it's punishment. So yeah, you might come out and you might not be corrected, as, as, they, mm-hmm. as the correctional system says. You might not be because they're not really looking at the individual and figuring out it's a system and it's a business. So when I, when I started realizing that, I was like, okay, I got to show up. So um, Scott, but I got in contact with Scott Budnick, and we went and and you know we just sat down and talked to women and men who were incarcerated, and it gave me a better understanding. As Brian Stevenson says, it's great to be proximate. Um, so being proximate, and as you know, Kwa, being in that mm-hmm. prison, you get a better understanding and a different like connection with people who've committed even violent crimes, 
You yeah. still see them as human beings. And um, I think, you know, that was an important thing for me. And that's what started my quest to actually like changing the system. I'm not I'm not a person that says, like, if you commit a crime, you you know, you you should do the time you need to do, but the time should be like you should be getting corrected, you should be getting healed, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. and like come out of this a better person. And I've witnessed people who like I sat down with people, some of the smartest, the most enlightened people I met in prison. And ironically enough, some of them trace a lot of their anger and hurt and violence to their own sexual abuse mm. or physical abuse and trauma. And, um, yeah. you know, one person in particular, this dude named Bobby Gons, he just broke it down to me like how when he was eight, he was nine, like when he was five, he was molested by this kid that was older. And then mm. he didn't know how to express it in his neighborhood. That that shit ain't cool. What you going to say? People going to start calling you this and that. So he said it. the only thing he did was throw a punch. And then he he felt like that was his way of expressing things and like getting it all off of him. So then mm. it became into to, to actually murder. He committed murder. And only until he went to prison did he come into the realization of what he what had caused him to become who he was. And how to reconcile that, and um, everybody don't get that chance no. like to reconcile it because all every prison is not giving people like real tools to heal and real tools to be better. That being said, yeah. man, um, I'm here to like get make sure that that the criminal justice system is 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 fair. Like I would love for mm -hmm. it to be gone, like, but as so, you know, while it's still here, I say, man. Let's make sure human beings get opportunities and chances to be better. Let's not send people to jail that that committed these crimes that now, you know, people out making money on. You still got somebody That's in jail right. for selling yes. weed, you know. Yeah. So anyway, y'all know I'm 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 about that right there. And um mm -hmm. I work with 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 um ARC anti-recidivism coalition, which is Scott's organization. I work with um, great group of people, great group of I people. I work with, yeah. Imagine Justice. We've actually did some, we got some some like bills passed. I got to sit down with um some legislators in 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 California and we got some bills passed. One bill was was this bill SB 394, which really allowed no longer will you, will um underage like um people who commit crimes they won't be able to be sentenced to life without parole. Thank they will always be able to go be examined at the board. So that, mm. that's that been some of the work that I've been most proud of. And um, yeah, that's what we've been doing with the criminal justice system. Word up. Um, you yeah. just now broke down something very interesting about how we are taught to hide our feelings. And and that as you, you spoke about toxic masculinity, essentially. Um, yeah. On my album, Liberation, on the song Funny Money, I have a mm -hmm. lyric that goes, I ain't fucking with the pay for play. That shit is gay. Now, since then, I've evolved and I've outgrown this lyric and I've apologized for it. Um, but as a black man trying to make a name for myself in hip hop, sometimes I would lean into uh, targeting gay people in order to assert my manhood. Um, you and I were placed on a list some years ago where they talked about how conscious artists will sometimes have lyrics that could be seen as homophobic. Um you have also got criticized for this, and it seems like you've grown from this and, and grown and moved on from this as a man. Talk to me a little bit about how you feel like you've evolved on this front. Um, what's the difference between Cornbread Com, who's out there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, trying to assert his manhood, and Microsoft Com, who's out there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, man, I mean, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. The the mm -hmm. the mentality was was masculinity is a way of survival. It was what we learned from older guys, you know. And mm -hmm. we didn't. I, I'm gonna be honest. And, and I never really had a a man sit down and say, "Hey, this is how you step to be a man," you know. Or even mm -hmm. like I did have some some pretty good examples as far as like a stepfather, but it was never like really someone saying, "Hey, these are the things you do." Um, so I learned from my homies and mm -hmm. older cats and being hard was a way to get respect and being like, you know, it was a way you get around and survive. So mm -hmm. the, the use of those words, that mentality was part of the, a part of 
our lives. It was part of our culture. It was, you know, it is what you would say when you was trying to like down somebody. You mm-hmm. know, you was you would call them like you would say, "Oh, this person is gay." Or, you know, you you know you fag. You you would say those mm-hmm. things. Um, and that was a learned behavior that was passed in for a lot of black men in the inner cities. We got it. No matter how, you didn't have to be a gangster. That was just part of what you, our culture. Mm-hmm. Um, as I start to grow as an individual, start to say, okay, the certain things that I've experienced in life are things that I'm going to carry with me, traditions. Some mm-hmm. things are things that I truly, Rashid, don't feel is me. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, like like I said, I, the same way I was seeking out what is my spirituality and how? what's my relationship to God? I'm not mm-hmm. just going to only take with my mother just because my mother had me going to church and this and like, I'm seeking finding myself. I started seeking how I feel about different things. Well, mm-hmm. funny enough, I was at a show and these two gay guys came up to me after my show and said, Common, we love you. But man, it hurt us when you be saying this faggot, this and that. And it was really one of the first times like, I actually heard from somebody who was gay what they felt about me saying this. So it made me step back and consider it. I wasn't, I didn't try to get defensive. And I was like, wow, this is a human being telling me, these two human beings telling me they was hurt from that. Mm-hmm. I eventually ended up doing a song called Between Me, You and Liberation, which I was talking about, like, if my friend, I'm, it was on an electric circus, and it's talking about if my friend told me he was gay, what would, how would I react? Yes. And... I did that because I was like, man, this is my growth right now. I'm not like homophobic. I don't have anything against gay people. So this is my growth. Um, one thing that I like don't I don't subscribe to is that whole, yo, you did this back then, so you persecuted forever. Like you said right. that word back then. So like right. I, that's not that that's not life. It's many things I've done that I've grown and evolved from. But that's what life is about. I'm, I'm, I didn't have the understanding and wisdom that I had when I was 19 that mm-hmm. I have now. And I'm still going to mm-hmm. continue to grow. Until I leave this planet, I want to be growing. We all should. So, yeah. I, I mean, I just chalk it up to me evolving. And, and that's just the truth of, of the path. The people who who can look and say, man, you said this and that. Yes, I did. And I don't feel that way anymore. And, and it's some things I'm saying probably two weeks ago that I made evolve from now, you know, and, and, and feel something different. But my point is that's what life is. And I really, you know, this whole, the whole mentality of, man, you did one thing wrong and it's, and you done. I don't understand that because, you know, I just know that we all human beings and we all evolve. Um, I think that when it comes to, to that, as long as you acknowledge and you have learned from it, then I feel like, you should be able to move on. It's the people that still are making excuses or don't acknowledge like, oh, I hurt somebody. or Oh, I shouldn't have said that. That deserved to be canceled forever. But that's, uh, that's a great that's a great point, though. That's a great point, like acknowledging it. And honestly, that's one of the lessons I learned just where, um, where, as a father. When my, my daughter confronted me and Omoye, she was like, man, she had a conversation with me like, Man, I don't feel like you was a good dad in this area, that area. And I was like, first I was getting a little defensive and being like, and then I just had to step back and say, you know what? Let me listen to her. Let mm-hmm. me acknowledge these are her feelings. I don't have to agree with everything she's saying, but even if without agreeing or trying to fix it, just let me hear her out. And I yeah. think, you know, it's important what you just said, Jazz, is the acknowledgement of these things and just recognizing that in somebody and just saying, I actually hear you and I respect you and honor you as a human being. And sometimes that'll come with disagreement too, Mm -hmm. but it's still, you know, it's important to do what you said. You founded the Common Ground Foundation uh, fairly early in your career and um, your work in organization, what is your work in organization doing right now? I know that through COVID you've been helping bring awareness to incarcerated people, but what else are you guys working on? Yeah. So Common Ground is actually we do, it's a youth-oriented group. Um, we, well, mm-hmm. well, our work is with the youth, and we mentor youth, and we help get them prepared for college or whatever their profession is, or, you know, what their desire to go into a profession is. 
It's really about just self development. We help them, you know, we have mentors that get, you know, teach them about nutrition. They do social activist work. They've gone themselves and went out and, and helped with um, inner city farming. They've helped um, with some Dope. of the people who've been incarcerated. So we actually al- allowing them to feed back into their communities as they're growing too as young people. Um, and right now, during this whole time of the pandemic, they've been really strong, like having Zoom meetings and really like sharing a lot of information, getting prepared for, for black colleges and, and different things like that and just learning about those things. But And one of the things that I've been like able to participate in and I love is sometimes we have our summer camps where they go away. They just get away from Chicago, go on these trips, and we, you know, they do everything from yoga to just like talks with, with uh, um, like it's like the men, the men mentors sit down with the young men and they just, we just have real open talks. It's like a therapy session. And the women do, do it with the young ladies. They do all like, trust walks, all these different things that, that we do during these camps. And it's so beautiful to watch the kids go from like, they get out into these areas where it's like, you know, it's the woods, it's like camp. Mm-hmm. And, and they like, oh, what the hell, to watching them participate in yoga, watching them participate mm. in, the, in the creative arts sessions that we have and, and watching them like put their cell phones away and really open up in these sessions. So the Common Ground Foundation has been one of the things I've been most proud of um, because it's really feeding back to where I come from. And mm-hmm. and I, all I really want from what I said earlier too, Kwa, is like to create access. My thing is to create access for our kids. And, and just another mm-hmm. thing that we, we've actually did to, to add on to that is uh, I opened up a school um, and it's a charter school. I know you, so you're right, the public schools need <laughs> The kids too, but we opened up a charter <laughs> school called AIM. It's called AIM, Art in Motion. And mm-hmm. what is geared towards is academic, but it's also art based. So my vision is to be able to get our kids to 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 be able to see what it is to be a lighting director, to be able to see what it is to be a costume designer, and have mm-hmm. like people from the from those businesses come and talk to them, uh, and so they can say, oh, it's not only about being the actor. Wait, oh, you could be a, a, a sound engineer or you could be, you know, just expose them to things that we never knew existed growing up. Like, I, I know I didn't shoot. I mean, I, mm-hmm. Kwai, you was in the movies early, so you knew yeah. about movie making. But I come from a family of actors. And so, yeah, I, I knew. I, but again, I was privileged with that. Like, um, no, I mean, and, and that's basically what, um, you know, like for me, with Common Ground and AIM, they're two of the like the beautiful thing about AIM is like that school is less than two miles from where I grew up. Oh, wow. And for me to be able to walk up into that building and see, like, kids, like, I think your name may be painted on the wall, too. Like, in our music room... Wow. It's it's all these artists, from Gangstar mm-hmm. to Talib Kweli to That's Lena true. Horn, painted on the walls. And I know that they are learning about you, and I know that they are learning about Coltrane, and I know that they're mm-hmm. learning about Nina Simone, you know, and... Man, it's just important for me to be able to share that with them and create an environment where they can get that. So that's been the key with Common Ground and, and AIM. That's beautiful, brother. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Once again, we have a couple more questions um, mm-hmm. but that I have to ask you, but I just want to take the time before we ask these questions to just thank yeah. you for giving us so much of your time. Yeah. We're so gracious uh, for it. Um, I asked you to join me in Ferguson uh, to do a concert for the people in Ferguson. We did a free concert. You've always been there for the people from Common Ground to, to Asada Shakur. I saw you in Kentucky marching for Breonna Taylor uh, with the people. You had your mask on and all that. Recently, yeah. when we was hanging out, uh, you talked to me about working with political candidates to hold them, try to hold them accountable, and you were trying to go do work in that space. Can you expound on what you were talking about? Yeah, so it's something we we have organized called Urgency 2020. This is one of the most important elections of our lifetime. And one reason is, not only is it the presidential election that we obviously want to remove any hatred and and, and negativity from, from that chair, from that position, but it's also a time where, you know, um, the, the Senate can be won by a group of people who may be open to, to working more with with all people, meaning 
Mm-hmm. You know, like this whole, and I'm not a, let me, let me be clear, I'm not a politician where I'm like, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. I'm mm-hmm. I'm like, for whoever's going to do good by the people, as far as my knowledge mm-hmm. and, and interaction with them goes. So this, this election, some of the things that we want to see change, like we're looking at policing, we're looking at education, we're looking at like creating more economics. For, for black and brown people in poor neighborhoods. Um, these are, I see candidates out there and I'm learning more and getting acquainted with more candidates that represent that change per se. Um, like how state, what Stacey Abrams was to, to Georgia. It's, it's, um, like it, it was a, it's a person like Jamie, Jamie Harrison, um, in, in, um, in South Carolina that is, that is running for Senate that actually cares about the people. And what what we're doing is like, we're going, we're taking time to sit down with these uh, elected officials or soon, hopefully they will be elected officials and say, hey, these are the things that we want to see happen for these communities. And we're not doing that without the community people being there. And we'll be sitting down and talking to, with you know, from the people, the community people, along with these people that are running for office, and say, okay, these are our demands. Okay, you got that? Cool. We are here to support. We'll use our voice to get more attention and more people to to know about you. So they go out and vote. They're not only saying, oh, I got to vote for the president. I got to, you also got to know voting for your senator, voting for your district attorney. And these are positions that I didn't know affected us as much as they do. So now that Mm -hmm. I'm learning that, I just want to continue to educate our people on that so they can go out and, and support people who can actually change policy for them and who cares about changing policy for them. So that's what Urgency 2020 is. I'm working with Alicia Keys and a, and a few other people. Um, we also have teamed up with Le- LeBron has something called More Than a Vote. We um not really partner, but we're going to be supporting what they're doing um, because they're really encouraging people to vote without. They're doing it without, not, without being like, yo, vote for this person. But mm-hmm. we're like, yo, go out and vote. But this is the person to vote for. And if and, and if you need to sit down and talk, like, I feel like if I'm going to put my word and my mouth out there, for my word for somebody, then it's going to be somebody that's, that's truthful, somebody that cares about human beings and, and can be a great leader in that area. So that's what that's, that's about. Word up. Um, there was this Viola Davis clip that just went viral this week. Oh, and, that was dope. And uh, she said... I got the Oscar, I got the Emmy, I got two Tomies, Tonys, I've done Broadway, I've done Off-Broadway, I've done TV, and I've done film. I've done all of it. People say you're a black Meryl Streep. You are, and we love you. We love you. There's no one like you. Okay, then if there's no one like me, if you think I'm that, you pay me what I'm worth. You give me what I'm worth. You rapped about Viola Davis in Black America Again, which also features Stevie Wonder. You mentioned Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland. Um, so my question is, what is your higher purpose now? And what do you think that you owe the next generation? Man, I, I feel like my higher purpose is to be a, a, a vessel of, for, for the most high God, like in any shape, form and fashion. And that, and it usually begins with me. We're dealing with, with our people, um, and, and making, creating awareness and, um, inspiring and, creating environments of of happiness and, and love and like freedom for our people um mm-hmm. and I and I really it starts with me for with black people because I that's my, where I grew up and that's who I know and love and I know that we also don't get a lot of the same op- opportunities and exposure but it also is about black and brown people and it also is about humanity um mm-hmm. it, itself so I'm not just only looking and saying, man, I want to change it only for black people. I want to change it for a better society overall. But it starts, you know, with me doing a lot of that work for our people because we the ones in this in this situation that is, have taken the shorthand of a lot of things, um, taking less than in, in a lot of areas. We just haven't had as much access. So my thing purpose now is to continue to create the access to, to set examples, but also be active and, 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 and have action items, a la policy change, a la opening up schools, a la like, you know, teaming up with community 
community activists and people who already are doing work and changing those situations. As far as Hollywood goes, it's creating um, avenues for for voices to get out there that are new, that are young, that are fresh, um, and like letting letting them see what new fresh art is coming from these black and brown creators. Um, mm-hmm. The world needs it, man, and and it's one of the most powerful ways to help change things. Also, is through art. Um, I mean, for mm-hmm. me, like. Mm-hmm. I think the movie Moonlight was like a movie that without saying it was like, hey, black people experience and feel different things. This is a young black kid growing up in Miami in the hood. His mother was on was on drugs. He ended up being a gay young man, but he's a human being. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and, and I think that that, that a, a story like that makes you uh, look at black males in different ways. And I think mm-hmm. what I want to do is make sure we create, like I said, whether it's a eternal sunshine and spotless mind, but yeah. in our own way, or a Shawshank Redemption, or you know, or a Godfather for that matter. Um, mm-hmm. Black and Godfather. I think, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think you know, um, Viola Davis is such a, a gifted and powerful oh, yes. um, woman and person and talent and human being that. What she said was so um, necessary and it's so eye-opening to because she is, everywhere you go, you hear how respected she is, but to know that she's not getting those opportunities uh, as far as equality when it comes to pay. Um, and that's just for women in general, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But black women are taking even the shorter end of it. Amen. So if she mm-hmm. spoke to it, it's like... Um, I got to do something about it. Like I can't sit there. Mm-hmm. That's why we, while we was there, I was there for Breonna Taylor, and we was there. Was like, as as a man, I got to be there. I can't like only show up for the situations that happen with men. Mm-hmm. I got to show up when it's happening and bring and bring um, attention and the, and the same amount of support, if not more, to the situations that's happening with our women too. Yeah. So I think you know. For me, for the new generation, I'm like, I try to share as much information as I got and create like opportunities for them. One of the biggest joys for me has been to do the shot, to be executive producer on the shot. Like I never, man, I walked on that set and was like, man, I'm in my hometown and yeah. we filming a TV show. And I got people from Chicago that's working, this, working on the crew, doing locations, mm-hmm. doing the makeup. The woman who, who was doing hair, Used to do my mother's hair, wow. like, right. and she's hair working on on a film that I'm, I'm uh, on a TV show that I'm producing. Right. That's rewarding to be able to authentic. go back. Yeah, to be able to go back home and do that. So that's what I want to do. Cre- like, create those opportunities. Yes. Yeah, man. Well, you're an artist. You're a pure artist. You're a true artist. Artists have to create. Writers have to write. We have to yeah. make things. And in the lockdown, it's harder to create things because we can't get together as much. But uh, I saw you and Tiffany Haddish and a whole bunch of other actors recreating and hamming, hamming it up in the Princess Bride remake. <laughs> Tell me about how that project came together. Because I, I, I know the Princess Bride by heart. Nobody asked me to be in a movie. I could have did every part. <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> Have fun yo, storming the castle. I know all the lines. So Yo, I love it. Hey, quiet. <laughs> I ain't going in front. I was... Yo, I was late to it on Princess Bride, but that joint was dope, mm-hmm. man. Like that was a That's one of my favorite a, movies of all time. Man, it's a fun, good movie, man. It's a it's a great movie. And um, you know, Jason Reitman, he's the director who um did Juno. He did um Up in the Air. He's actually the son of the director of Ghostman, um, Ghostbusters, the first early Ghostbusters. Um his uh, father. How Ramis Reitman. did Hal Ramis direct it? No, it's something Reitman. Oh, I forgot his first oh, name. Oh, Ivan Reitman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's his. That's his. That's his dad. Um. So. Okay. Anyway, J- Jason called me uh, right early on during the. He um texted me early on during the, the pandemic when we you know during the lockdown and was like, "Yo, uh, I'm doing Princess Bride, man. We just doing it on our you know like a, a project, but it's going to charity. A, a million dollars will be going to this charity." And I was like, "Okay, I'm down, man. You know." And he was like, well, will you and Tiffany do this thing? I said, well, I got to ask Tiffany, you know, if that's something <laughs> she would want to do. And right. 
I, you know, she was down. She was like, yeah. She's like, how much are we getting paid? I was like, we ain't getting paid. And then she was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> she's like, right. I said, it's for charity. It's for charity. But, you know, so we ended up doing it. Um, and it was fun, man. We, you know, we we had uh, this this young cat uh, who does a lot of videography, videography work, just film us. And it was, we actually filmed it right in my house. Um, and it was, man, it was dope. Like, and to see, like, Hugh Jackman is in it, John Hamm, yeah. uh, Josh Gad. It's like all these people are in right. it playing, you know, the same characters. Uh, we all play the same, you know. Like, it's... And, the and Dread later on Roberts in the and Wesley. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it's, man, it was a fun project, man. I'm glad, you know, we got to put it out there. No doubt. Well, shout out to John Hamm, who just... I see him walking around over here. Um, yeah. Rosh, I really appreciate you doing this with us um yeah. you know let's go get some to eat brother i appreciate yeah. you <laughs> yeah, let's get some food People, let's get some food jazz people's jazz, party you can finish eating finish eating your fries but why you gotta tell her where i've eaten hot, hot fries, fries. <laughs> <laughs> but hey you're still a rattler it's all love it's all love the... rush i love you brother thank you for doing love this you, people's bro. party it's it. proud to have common word is bond <laughs>